Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. I wanted to bring your attention to some very important announcements that I think slid under the radar in the U.S. media. China just announced two very important milestones in their space program. The first is the completion of what will be, currently, the most powerful rocket engine operating on Earth. This will be the YF-130, designed to fly on the massive Long March 9 Super Heavy Lift rocket. This rocket has gone through several different iterations. Let's look at current rocket engines flying today and see how it compares. The YF-130 will produce about 5,000 kilonewtons of thrust, or about 500 tons in Elon speak. That will put it far ahead of the Raptor, which is 2,300 kilonewtons, being tested now for the first orbital flight of Starship, and even ahead of the Blue Origin BE-4, which is rated at 2,400 kilonewtons, soon to be flying on the Vulcan rocket system and later the new Glenn. The YF-130 is an oxidizer-rich staged combustion engine that uses RP-1 fuel and liquid oxygen, much like the RD-180, but with a higher thrust and nearly equal efficiency, with a specific impulse of up to 339 seconds. Remember that the RD-180 has one turbo pump, two combustion chambers, and two nozzles. Using multiple combustion chambers was how the former Soviet Union solved the problem of combustion instability. Because of the single pump, the RD-180 is still considered a single engine, as will the YF-130, which will look much the same as an RD-180. Here are some drawings and images of the YF-130. The RD-180 was derived from the RD-170 and its successor, the RD-171M. This was the king of RP-1 rocket engines, and indeed the most powerful rocket engine ever flown. The RD-171M flew on the former Soviet Union's Energia rocket system. The RD-171M had four combustion chambers and four nozzles, but again, just one turbo pump. This engine was more powerful and much more efficient than the F-1 RP-1-fueled engine that powered the Saturn V to the moon for the United States. But it came too late to help the Soviet Union compete. The RD-171M was retired, along with the Energia and most of the Soviet space program, when the Soviet Union dissolved in the early 1990s. The extremely efficient RD-180 is still flying today, but who knows for how long. Russia had planned to use the RD-180 on a new series of Rus-M rockets, but this program was canceled. It was used on the American Atlas and Antares rockets when American-Russian relations were good, but had been ordered to be replaced by Congress when that relationship soured. Even before the attack on Ukraine, it was clear that Vladimir Putin's Russia did not want to be friends with the U.S., Six days after the start of the Russian-Ukrainian war, Russia announced an end to all sales and support for RD-180 engines in the United States. The choice of RP-1 might seem like a throwback to older times, with so many aerospace companies now using methane and liquid natural gas. But RP-1 has a lot of advantages for a first stage. It is much denser than methane, it does not need to be stored at cryogenic temperatures, and its properties are well known and predictable. If we look back, in fact, we can see that in the 1960s, the American space program had engines like the H-1, which were used on the Saturn 1B rocket system to launch Apollo astronauts into space. This system had no problem reaching low Earth orbit. The Saturn V, with the massive F-1 engines, were needed mainly to get to the moon, and for Skylab on one mission. The H-1 was later modified into the RS-27 for use on the Delta ICBM and then eventually retired. An RP-1-powered rocket engine can also be reused, as proven by the SpaceX Merlin rocket engine, the current king of thrust-to-weight ratios. The Chinese are betting that the powerful RP-1-fueled YF-130 will allow them to jump ahead in the new space race. The Long March 9 is currently planned to be a three-stage rocket with four side boosters. The first stage and the side boosters will be powered by RP-1 and liquid oxygen at first. The second and third stages will be liquid hydrogen and oxygen powered. The launch system is planned to be operational by 2030 and should be able to get 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit and 50 metric tons on its way to the moon. China is also fielding this. This is the Smart Dragon 3. This will be the world's largest solid propellant rocket system and it has four stages. The Smart Dragon 3 will have a liftoff mass of 140 metric tons 
and will be able to launch up to 20 satellites at a time and get a 1.5 metric ton payload to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. Solid propellant rockets are ideal for rapid use in case something strange starts abducting your communication satellites. We're looking at you, X-37B. The United States still uses the Minotaur rocket system based on the Minuteman II ICBM, and you can learn all about that system in this lesson. By 2035, China plans to have a fully reusable two-stage launcher. The first stage will be 10.6 meters in diameter, wider than Starship, and even wider than the old Saturn V first stage. This Chinese reusable rocket system will use 26 2,000 kilonewton liquid methane and oxygen engines. The third version planned by China will be 110 meters long and have a takeoff mass of 4,122 metric tons. Not as much as Starship and just a little shorter, but with very similar capabilities. I would argue that if Elon Musk doesn't stop wasting time and money with Twitter, he may very well see China take the lead in the new space race. Let's hope that he can get his head back in the game and focus on the big picture. And now let's review what China has accomplished so far in space. Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. When we talk about a nation's progress, it is often hard to know where to start. Does the history of the United States start with its successful founding in 1783? or its Declaration of Independence in 1776? How about the landing of the Mayflower? Or North America's quasi-discovery by Columbus? But what about the Vikings landing in Nova Scotia 500 years earlier? Or the migration of native peoples from Asia and elsewhere? I think we can agree the United States became a nation in 1783, but its character is shaped by its history. The same is true of China. China has an exceedingly long history, being one of the oldest cultures on Earth. The oldest fossils of any Homo species found so far are Homo erectus near Beijing and are 400,000 years old. Homo sapiens, modern humans, migrated out of the Middle East about 100,000 years ago, and the oldest fossils in China go back about 60,000 years. The oldest Chinese writings go back about 3,200 years. The first emperor is recorded as being about 2,300 years ago. The title of Huangdi, or emperor, was passed down for over 2,000 years. Then things changed. In 1911, the Qing dynasty collapsed. The empire of China was at an end, and the modern nation was born as a republic. This can be seen as the end of the old system, but there was a half century of turmoil before a new order was firmly established. The First Republic lasted from 1911 to 1949, when it was overthrown. In 1949, the Communists, led by Mao Zedong, founded the People's Republic of China. We'll use that as the foundation of modern China. World War II had ended and most nations on Earth had been devastated, with the exception of the United States. The U.S. had come out of World War II with a massive industrial base and the atomic bomb. This bomb had been used on the Japanese, and no one doubted its reality. The Japanese had surrendered after two cities were destroyed by nuclear weapons. Japan had controlled Korea, but after the war, Korea was divided between the North, controlled by the Soviet Union, and the South, controlled by the United States and its allies. China was now ruled by communists, and they supported the Soviet Union and North Korea. On 25 June 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea to try to reunite the country. At first, the United Nations forces, led by the Americans, were pushed back. Then an amphibious attack by U.S. Marines landed at Incheon and forced the Korean People's Army back across the 38th parallel. Then the United Nations forces invaded North Korea, pushing the North Korean soldiers up to the Yalu River, which was a border with China. The Chinese did not take this well and sent the People's Volunteer Army across the Yalu in support of the North Korean communists. United Nations forces were pushed back, and Seoul, the capital of South Korea, changed hands four times. The communist forces were finally pushed back to the 38th parallel again, where the war had started. Three million people had been killed, and every major city in Korea had been bombed over the intervening three years. Both sides had committed terrible massacres. The American president called the leaders of China and threatened to use nuclear weapons. 
the Chinese agreed to negotiate and an armistice was signed. This disparity in power convinced the Chinese that they needed two things, atomic weapons and a means of delivering them. The American Air Force would almost certainly intercept and shoot down any plane you sent to bomb the United States. But rockets were something different. The Germans had proven that it was extremely hard to stop a ballistic missile. The Chinese decided to get their own rockets. The Soviets had taken the German V-2 rocket and relabeled it the R-2. This technology was shared with China and China started working on ballistic missiles. They quickly doubled the range of the R-2 and continued improving their rocket technology. In 1967, as the space race was heating up, the first premier of the new China, Zhao Enlai, serving under Chairman Mao, decided that China should not be left behind. China developed the Shu Guang-1, seen here, in 1968, which was intended for crewed flight and started selecting and training astronauts, called Taikonauts by the Chinese. These Taikonauts were selected by the newly formed China Space Medical Institute. A new space center was constructed at Xichang in the Sichuan province, and a Dongfeng-3 medium-range ballistic missile was launched in December 1968 as China started developing its own heavy lift satellite launch vehicle. This was called the Fingbao-1, seen here, and was developed from the DF-5 ICBM. The Fingbao-1, like most Chinese ICBMs, used hypergolic fuel. It had a mass of 191,700 kilograms with two stages. It was a total of 33 meters tall and had a diameter of 3.35 meters. It could get a payload of up to 2,500 kilograms to low Earth orbit. The first stage had a thrust of 3,000 kilonewtons from four YF-20A rocket engines. These engines burned nitrogen tetroxide and unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine. These chemicals are also used in the SpaceX Super Draco abort engines. The YF-20 uses a gas generator, like the Merlin engine. When four of them are mounted as a unit, they are called the YF-21. The vacuum version is called the YF-22, and when paired with the YF-23 Vernier engines, seen here, is called the YF-24 and is used for the second stages. New versions of this engine used on boosters are called the YF-25. These engines are also used on the Long March 2, 3, and 4, which we'll cover shortly. These engines have a specific impulse of 259 seconds at sea level and 289 seconds in vacuum. China launched 11 of these with four failures, putting seven satellites into orbit. In parallel to the Fingbao-1, the Chinese had been developing this, the Long March 1 SLV also called the CZ-1, or Changjing-1. In this design, a solid rocket motor third stage was added to a DF-4 two-stage ICBM. The DF-4 used nitric acid and UDMH for propellant. The CZ-1 had a mass of 81,570 kilograms and was planned to get 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit. It was launched twice. The CZ-1 uses the YF-2A rocket engine. This engine burns UDMH and red fuming nitric acid, or nitrogen tetroxide all very toxic by the way. The YF-2 engine is made when you combine four YF-1 engines. The YF-2 is a gas generator cycle basic rocket engine. This rocket was launched twice with two successes. The DF-5 ICBM was used to design the CZ-2. This became the Long March 2A or CZ-2A. The CZ-2A is similar to the CZ-1 and was a two-stage rocket. It had three successful launches out of four attempts. It was last flown in 1978 and was replaced by the 2C. The 2C was a three-stage rocket using four YF-21C engines burning NTO and UDMH. The second stage uses one YF-22 with four YF-23C Vernier engines and the unit is called the YF-24E. The Chinese continued making different variants of these hypergolic rockets going through the variants you see here. From the 1970s to the present, the China National Space Administration developed the Long March 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and finally 11. There was either no Long March 10, or we don't talk about Long March 10. Variants of the Long March 3, 4, and 6 are all small satellite hypergolic rockets and are still being used. The Long March 5 and 5B are active and can get 25,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit, making it China's most powerful rocket to date. Let's take a close look at this one, as it is a departure from the basic hypergolic rockets that came before. The Long March 5 is a three-stage rocket with boosters. The first stage uses two YF-77 rocket engines burning liquid hydrogen and oxygen. 
The YF-77 is designed by the Academy of Aerospace Liquid Propulsion Technology, and it uses a gas generator, producing 700 kilonewtons at 10.2 megapascals of pressure, with an efficiency of 310 seconds at sea level and 430 seconds in vacuum. The second stage uses two YF-75D engines, also burning hydrogen, with a specific impulse of 442 seconds. Hydrogen is much more efficient than RP-1. The YF-75D is a third generation rocket engine and uses a closed expander cycle, meaning cold hydrogen is sent around the nozzle to cool it. Then the expanded hydrogen is used to power the turbine to pump more fuel and oxidizer into the engine. The third stage is called the Yongjing and uses two YF-50D pressure-fed restartable hypergolic engines running NTO and UDMH producing 6.5 kilonewtons of thrust. Being restartable allows this third stage to circularize in orbit. Variants of this third stage are used on the Long March 2, 3, 5, and 7 rockets. The Long March 5 uses four boosters, burning RP-1 through two YF-100 engines. The YF-100 is an oxygen-rich stage combustion engine producing 1,200 kilonewtons at sea level with a specific impulse of 300 and 1,340 kilonewtons in vacuum with a specific impulse of 335 seconds. So we have a central core burning hydrogen with four RP-1 boosters around it. Look familiar? This is the same basic design of the much larger Energia rocket system. The Long March 5 put the tn win one on its way to Mars and sent the Chang'e 5 to the moon. The Long March 7, 8, and 11 are all much weaker than the 5 and are in service placing satellites into orbit. The Long March 11 is a solid fuel rocket, by the way. With these rocket systems, the Chinese have been able to make great progress in space exploration. They have been rapidly repeating the landmarks of the Soviet and American space programs. The Chinese had access to Soviet Soyuz technology, and they modified the basic Soyuz capsule to be larger and more capable. Here you can see the changes that were made, and here you can see the Shenzhou compared to other space capsules from around the world. It can hold a crew of three with a pressurized volume of eight cubic meters in the orbital module, and another six in the descent module. It is between the SpaceX Dragon capsule and the Lockheed Martin Orion in volume. The Shenzhou-1 was basically a test of the exterior design without a life support or abort system. It was fired into orbit with a Long March 2F rocket, seen here in 1999, and survived 21 hours and about 14 orbits before re-entering and landing safely. The first Tycho knot in orbit was Yang Li Wei flying the Shenzhou 5, launched in 2003, also on a Long March 2F. This was the equivalent of the Soviet's launch of Gagarin and the U.S. of Alan Shepard. The next flight for the Chinese manned space program was the equivalent of a Gemini mission. The Shenzhou 6 was launched with the 2F carrying Fei Junlong and Nie Haixing. They stayed in low Earth orbit for five days, testing equipment and carrying out scientific experiments. Shenzhou 7 was launched in 2008, carrying three crew. This was the first spacewalk carried out by China. Taikonauts Zhai Zhigang and Liu Boming performed EVAs while Jing Haiping helped monitor. The Chinese have developed their own spacesuit called Fei Tian, which was modeled on the Orlan M. The Orlan spacesuits were developed by the Soviet space program in the 1970s and worked very well. FATN translates roughly as Skyflyer. In 2011, NASA was ordered by Congress to no longer work in any way with the Chinese space program. I'm not sure of the wisdom of alienating your greatest competitor, but I'm not a politician. Maybe they know something I don't. In any event, the Chinese seem to be doing fine on their own. In that same year, the Chinese launched their own space station. The Tiangong-1 is a Chinese space station module with a mass of 8,500 kilograms placed into orbit in September 2011, also with a Long March 2F. Tiangong means heavenly palace. Shenzhou-8 was an unmanned capsule that docked with Tiangong-1 in November of the same year. The Tiangong-1 was supposed to only orbit for two years, but stayed up until 2018. It was visited by the Shenzhou-9 in 2012 and the Shenzhou-10 in 2013. These missions included China's first female taikonauts, Liu Yang and Wang Yaping. It ended service in 2016 when telemetry was lost and the station was no longer under control. The station re-entered the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean and burned up on 2 April 2018. The Tiangong-2 had been launched on 15 September 2016. 
It is over 10 meters long and 4 meters in diameter with a mass of 8,600 kilograms. It can hold a crew of two for up to 30 days. It was visited by the Shenzhou 11 spacecraft the next month, crewed by Jing Haiping and Qin Dong. They stayed aboard for 30 days. In April 2017, a cargo version of the Shenzhou called the Tianzhu, Tianzhu means heavenly boat, docked remotely with the space station. All the other launches so far used the Long March 2F, but the Tianzhu was launched on a Long March 7. The Tianzhu was able to transfer propellant to the Tiangong 2, something necessary for long duration space station operations so it can maintain its orbit. The Tianzhu has a total mass of 12,900 kilograms and carries 6,500 kilograms of cargo. It will be the main resupply ship for future Chinese space operations. The Tiangong 2 practiced deorbiting maneuvers in 2018 and was successfully brought down in July 2019. The next step of the Chinese manned spaceflight program will be the Tianhe, or Harmony of the Heavens. This will be a core module based on the Soviet Salyut and Almaz series of space station modules. These systems were used to build the Mir space station, and China plans to use these proven designs to construct its own space station. The core module provides power, propulsion, and life support for the station. It will have a habitable living quarter section, a non-habitable service section, and a docking hub. It will have a small robotic arm to maneuver cargo capsules. Power is provided by two steerable solar power arrays. More modules are added until you have a space station big enough to accomplish your goals. China also has a very active lunar exploration program. In 2007, it sent an orbiter called the Chang'e-1, and a second orbiter called the Chang'e-2 was launched in 2010. These map the surface of the moon. Chang'e-3 was launched in 2013 with a lunar rover and made a soft landing. It was the first lunar landing in over four decades. Chang'e-4 was launched in December 2018 and landed a month later at the South Pole Lycan Basin on the far side of the moon. Chang'e-5 landed November of 2020 and returned a sample from the moon. The first sample return mission since Luna 24 in 1976 by the Soviets and the only sample from the far side of the moon ever recovered. China is making remarkable progress, and now they have plans for a manned lunar base. To accomplish this, they will need something more powerful than the Long March 5. But this one, the Long March 9, is in development. We discussed the potential of Russia and China working together on colonizing the moon. While Russia would have to dust off the mothballed energy system and start production to get 100 tons into orbit, China is actively building this rocket. This is planned to be a super heavy lift rocket system, proposed in 2018, that will lift 180 tons into low Earth orbit and get 65 tons to the moon or 50 tons to Mars. This would exceed the power of the Saturn V. The Long March 9 is planned to be a three-stage rocket with boosters. All three stages will burn hydrogen and use advanced fourth generation rocket engines. These engines are staged combustion engines. This is the future of the Chinese space program. With a total mass of almost 4 million kilograms, this would be the most powerful rocket ever flown. China has the largest population of any nation on Earth at 1.4 billion. Almost one-fifth of all humanity are of Chinese nationality. China is exceptionally good at getting its people to work together and accomplish great things. It is determined to expand its culture into the solar system. And if the China National Space Administration succeeds at building this rocket system, they will. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us out on Patreon if you can. And stay safe at Astro Proterra.
Thanks for listening, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.